Good morning. We're back on the homestead. We just finished the roof and we're kind of getting all the things together and sealed up, getting ready for winter because it's coming. But we also need some furniture. We got our buddy Joe here and he's going to make our stool. And uh, have you ever made a chair before? Uh, yeah, yeah, just a chair, never a stool though. Well, it should be easy. This is just going to be a simple, rustic, three legged chair. And uh, three legs are better than four. Really? Mm hmm. How come? It'll set wherever you put it. If the ground's uneven, the three legs will find find the even spot and you won't have that rocking motion. That makes sense. Did they ever build four-legged stools or when did they learn that three is best? I think it was just for the, the application, depending on where you were. If you're in a very nice home with a nice even floor, you know, like some of the richer people, yeah, four legs, I guess we're better. That's how you know you're in a fancy house when they got the four-legged stools. Yeah. yeah. Yep, the four-legged stools, definitely. So here's our process today, Joe. We have our oak seat blank. So this is just a square piece of wood. And we've got a bore holes in it. Sure. So we need the three holes and we'll use our dividers to kind of get the holes lined up. So we catch that there, we catch that close to the edge there, and that divides it in half. So we'll find our center mark. That's great. No need for a tape measure or anything. No, no. So now you know right there's your center and then use it to just kind of make a scratch. Oh, sorry, I'm slow. I never used one of these. Before. Oh no, that's okay. Oh yeah, you got your center there. Okay. So this is the, the auger that we're gonna use. And when we go in, it's gonna go at an angle. We want it to be back about that far so we have enough meat out here. So when we put it at an angle, it doesn't break out on the edge. Sure. So what you want to do is take the dividers now and then you make your scratch back and forth this way. Like that? Yep, just like that. And then that's exactly where the, uh, the auger is going to go in. That's your, your starting point. Now you have that tightened. Mm -hmm. The beauty about it is now you can come to the other side. Yeah. And then that'll mark it for the same. So all three of them will be the same distance back from the edge. Sure. I said it once, I said it again, uh, everyone should own a divider. It's uh, real easy to use and construction equipment got way too complicated. I think we'd be better off just using dividers. This will be great in the cabin. Uh, we've got a great fireplace, a great roof, but nowhere to sit. Do you have a favorite chair? I like the three-legged stool. Yeah, that makes sense. I'm not very fast at this. Uh, say you or somebody who really knows what they're doing, how long would it take them to build a stool like this? About 45 minutes. Wow, that's great. That's really fast. Here comes the oak. Well, we have our piece of oak already scratched out. Joe did a great job doing that. Now we're ready to bore some holes. Yeah, we, this is the, the draw horse mm -hmm. we've got it on. And you built this yourself? Well, us here at the homestead, we did it as a team. Nice. Um, yeah, you could have taken all full credit and I wouldn't have known. But that was <laughs> nice of you. Uh, they would have known. Busted. Sorry, I think this might take a little longer than 45 minutes. I like this casual approach to stool making. We don't need no Chippendale chairs. That's too fancy if you ask me. If you've got scrolls on your chair, you got too much money. Yeah, that rustic stuff's, you know, in style for some people. I think so. I read a, a book about chairs this year. Oh. I think it was called now, now I Sit Me Down. And it was, uh, he thinks that it was like the, this era was like the height of chair making. But I think he was thinking of all the fancy chair makers in Europe. But at the same time, this seems like 
for the most people were sitting on stuff like this. Mm -hmm. In the 18th century, uh, this part of the country, a lot of the furniture is very simple, rustic. We got a hole. Brandon's going to show me how to do it properly. He says he's an expert and the best woodworker on YouTube and they should come at him hard in the comments and uh, yeah, let, let him have it if you think he's uh, doing it wrong. Just kidding. I have a friend who's uh, on the shorter side and she has uh, she has to have a, a, a stool in her kitchen to get stuff from the cabinets to make a nice Christmas gift or something they have around her house. My wife's the same way. She's pretty short. Really? Do you have a stool or a stepladder around? Yeah, yep. that's great. This would be perfect. So if you have a, a short wife during this time period, you can make her a stool like this and solve a lot of problems. Awesome. Cool. Three legs. Three legs. All right, we got our got our legs cut to length. Now we just use the draw horse and the draw knife and we'll get them rounded up. Very rustic stool, so it doesn't have to be super pretty. But, you know, they got to fit in there and kind of wedge, so. Great. Yeah. Okay. It's a, a draw shave? Yeah, a draw knife. Draw knife. And it's very sharp. Okay. There. Perfect, perfect. Cool. That is the process. Just little by little, just rounding it off and we'll get it, you know, fairly round and we'll start testing it because we don't want it to be we don't want it to be too tight. So when we hammer them in, we want them to wedge, but not so much that it'll split the split the board. Feels great when you get a good one. What's your uh, favorite wood to work with? Mm. I have to say uh, tulip or poplar. Really? How come? It's because it's a uh, it's a hardwood. Like it's technically a hardwood. Yeah. but it's on the softer end of it and the grain is usually pretty straight and consistent so it takes it takes working pretty easy that's nice uh, oh we're close pretty close I got a good feeling about this one. I 
I can feel how good it's gonna be to sit on it already. Well, the hard part's done. Those legs are finally done. Right, thank goodness. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a tough one. So the next next thing is just cleaning up these sharp edges. And for that, we're gonna use a coffin plane. I guess, because uh, it looks like a coffin? Yep. And it'll just take off a little bit. And we'll just go on the edges and following the grains, kind of clean it up a little bit. I like this. Uh, compared to the other tools we've used, it, it works pretty easy. How would I describe it? It's like a uh, like a flat pencil sharpener, and the noise is even the same. Almost like you've done that before. I swear I've never built a rustic stool out of oak and hickory before. <laughs> It is so nice to be in the cabin now that it is sealed up. We've got a nice big fire going in here and it's warming up. Maybe a little too warm already. It's warming up. It's feeling great in here. And we've got some furniture in here. Thanks to our good friend and first guest here in the cabin, Joe Para. Yeah, thanks. I hope we made a good stool. It's a little bit tall, but um, I had a nice time making it. I really liked uh, the way we just kind of did things by eye. And uh, kept on going back to the, the rustic uh, theme, and it was fun to work that way and not worry too much about the details, but just kind of make it work. And it, it feels pretty good on my butt. So, Joe, some of the folks out there may not be familiar with who you are. Can you tell us all about what you do? Um, I'm a, a stand-up comedian, but I also have a, a show on Adult Swim called Joe Parrot Talks With You. I kind of describe it uh, by saying, uh, you know how a lot of shows on television feel like they're made by an energy drink? Well, uh, my show feels like it was made by apple cider. And, uh, yeah, it's just a little bit slower pace, but uh, good jokes, and I think, uh, yeah, I think, it's a, I think it's a pretty good show. And just finished season three, which will be out in November. Joe, I think it's a great show. Everyone out there should try it out. It's fun. So thank you, Joe, for coming in and, and doing hard work. Oh, I mean, I was just slapping mud on the walls, but you were doing the hard work. Brandon was very patient, but I think it came, yeah, I think it came out good. Hello. My name is Joe Para. I'm here with John, who made a deal with me, which said that uh, if I read a chapter from one of his favorite books, uh, he would make hot cocoa and toast over the open fire. It's a pretty good deal to me. Uh, so I haven't read this before, but it's uh, chapter 17. How I got in trouble riding in the canoe. I often rode in my canoe when I did not go fishing. I took one ride in it that I shall always remember. 
At least the remembrance of it has forced itself upon my mind a number of times in the days gone by, and I expect to think of it a few times more. Of course, my oldest sister, Rachel, who is now Mrs. Crandell of Dearborn, became acquainted with the young ladies of the neighborhood. One fine afternoon in the spring of the year when the winter water was high, two of her friends came to see her. They were considered very fine young ladies. Hear that, John? One was Miss Lucy Lord, the other I will call nameless, but she is an old resident and lives nearby. If at any time this should meet her eye, she will vouch for the truth of it. They came to spend the afternoon with sister. Of course, as all young men do, I believe, I felt a little flattered and thought, no doubt, one object of their visit was to see me. Whether my humble self was once in all their thoughts when they were making their toilet that day or not, I gave them the credit of it. What, what is this book, John? I thought I had never seen one of them, at least, look any better than she did that afternoon. Her hair was arranged very nicely, and she was very graceful. Of course, when my sister told me they wished very much for a boat ride, I could not very well to refuse to go with them. I hoped to let them see with how much skill I could manage my canoe, but alas for my skill. The flat was covered with water from our little ridge to the creek, a distance of 20 rods. It looked like a large river. The canoe was anchored near the ridge. The young ladies got in and we started from the landing. I had to look out for the stumps and the hummocks. What's a hummock? It's a bump. Oh, okay. I had to look out for the stumps and hummocks so as not to run against them nor run my boat aground. I had my passengers aboard and I stood in the hind end of the canoe. With a hand pole, I set it along with greater rapidity than it could have been paddled. We glided over the water on the flat amid the joyful acclamations and gleeful laughter of my fair companions. One said, I haven't had a boat ride before in Michigan. Miss Lucy, who sat on the bow end of the boat, waved her handkerchief and said, Oh, bless me, isn't this pleasant, sailing on the water? Another said, How nice we go. Of course, I propelled along with considerable speed. I thought I had one of the nicest, prettiest, and most intelligent load of passengers that had ever been in my canoe or on that water, and I would give them a nice ride. At least we got round as far as the creek. There the water ran more swiftly than it did on the flat. I told the young ladies I thought we had better not try to navigate that, but they all said, let us ride up the creek. Uh-oh. I thought I was master of the situation and could manage the canoe. I did not want to tell them that I was afraid, for fear they would say I was faint-hearted. I thought that would be very much against me, and as I had such a brave crew, I made up my mind to go up the strong current. I turned the bow of the boat up against the current as much as I could with one hold, but could not get it straight against the current. It shot against its length or more, and then I moved my hand pole to get a new hold. Now we were over the creek, and the water being four or five feet deep, it was impossible for me to get my pole down to the bottom again in time to save us. While I was trying to do that, the current being stronger than I supposed turned the boat sideways. I saw that we were gone for it. The girls sprang to one side of the boat, and down we went at one plunge, all together, into the water. My craft was foundered, filled with water, and went down, stream at least. Miss Lucy Lord was the heroine of the occasion. Luckily, she saved herself by jumping, though she got very wet. She got onto a little hummock on the bank and was on terra firma. Good thing I asked what hummock meant. Do they use that word a lot? Yeah. Sure. I use it today, don't you? Uh, yeah. I exerted myself to save the rest of the crew. The nameless girl's head came in sight about the same time my own did. Hello, she said, 
Lord, have mercy. Lord, help. Miss Lucy held out her hand and said, Come here and Lord will help you. I helped her and my sister to the bank as quickly as possible. I had to be very lively in securing the white pocket handkerchief that had been our flag while sailing. After they got fairly out, they started like three deer, as three deers they were, D-E-A-R-S, good pun, for the house, each one for herself. The way they made three wakes through that water was something new to me. I had never seen the like of that before. Miss Lucy went ahead full of life. They went through the water from one to two feet deep all the way to the ridge. There were father, mother, and all the rest to witness their safe arrival on the shore and join them in their merry, though I think sad laugh. I knew it would all be laid to me. After I watched them to the house and knew they were very jolly, I started for the canoe. It had gone down in the water to a large log that lay across the creek and launched it. I was as wet as I could be, and I jumped in again, drew it from the log, and pulled it along full of water up the creek until I got where the bank was a little higher. Then I drew the front end up, and the water ran over the back end. When it was so that I could tow it, I took it across the flat in front of the house and left it there in its place. Then. I went in the house. They had coined a brand new title for me. They called me Captain. They said I had come near drowning my passengers. Mother said it was not safe for young ladies to ride with me on the water. Father said he thought I was not much of a sailor, that I did not understand navigation, and I made up my mind that he was correct, that I was not much of a water man. And that's uh, chapter 17 of The Bark Covered House. William Nolan is a wonderful writer, and he's, he, he writes a fun book. I hope you enjoyed that chapter. I did a lot. It was uh, a good old-time fun. I thought it was going to get, uh, I don't know, by the way that you were smiling at the beginning and the way that he wouldn't name the one woman, <laughs> it was going to get a little bit weirder than it did. But I guess... Uh, just being embarrassed uh, in front of a woman by giving her a poor canoe ride was enough to uh, uh, write about back then. And he was uh, he was riding in a dugout canoe. So we made dugout canoes in the yeah. in the past year on the channel, and uh, they are heavy. They're very hard to maneuver in the water. Right, especially with what three pe other people in them. Three other people, and then the current and and everything. So. Uh, having having experienced a dugout canoe on a river, I know exactly what uh, what he was feeling there. Definitely. Well, here, Joe. Thanks for reading. There's your uh, hot chocolate. Of course. Hope you enjoy that. Yeah, I'm sure I will. And here we go. You know, I think the best way to deal with uh, toast and hot chocolate is to dip it. I've never seen that before. Oh, yeah. Mmm, that is good. I always think one of the most underrated foods is bread and butter. Bread and butter, and if you ask me, you put cheese on it. Oh, yeah. The first thing we cooked in the cabin was uh, toasted cheese, mm. uh, which is, you know, kind of cheese on, on toast, and it's so very, very good. You really can't beat the combo. Um, my one grandfather, he had, like, he loved doing his meals and courses and breaking stuff up, mm -hmm. but he would have dinner dessert and then he would have bread and butter as like a final thing with his mm -hmm. coffee so i guess it's kind of like that but he was very methodical with the the buttering and mm -hmm. i don't know maybe i just didn't appreciate it as much as i should have when i was younger but it's so good the simple things mm -hmm. welcome to 18th century cooking i'm your host john townsend today we've got a special guest in the kitchen joe para Welcome, Joe. Hello. And we're going to be cooking a thatched house pie. This is going to be fun. 
Thank you for joining us today as we savor the flavors and the aromas of the 18th century. Joe, I want to thank you for coming in to help us out with this recipe. Of course, I'll always show up for pie. This recipe comes from the Experienced English Housekeeper by Elizabeth Raffold. 1769. Could you read us this recipe, Joe? Of course. A thatched house pie. Take an earthen dish that is pretty deep, rub the inside with two ounces of butter, and spread over, over it two ounces of vermicelli. Make a good puff paste and roll it pretty thick, and lay it on the dish. Take three or four pigeons, season them very well with pepper and salt, and put a good lump of butter in them, and lay them in the dish with the breast down, and put a thick lid over them, and bake it in a moderate oven. When enough, take the dish you intend for it, and turn the pie onto it, and the vermicelli will appear like a thatch, which gives it the name of thatched house pie. It's a pretty side or corner dish for a large dinner or a bottom for a supper. Sounds pretty straightforward. It does sound pretty straightforward. It doesn't need a whole lot of interpretation. So today, instead of using pigeon, we're going to be using quail because I have access to some quail. Nice. Uh, I mean, maybe maybe you got you know pigeon there in New York, but yeah, you can kind of just go out and grab them. So there you go. We don't have a lot of pigeon here, at least in the no. grocery store. Sure. Right. Um, back in this period, how would you go about uh, getting the pigeon? Would you trap them or shoot them? Well, in this case, uh, it's calls for pigeon and, and pigeon and doves, very, very similar birds. And they would, they would keep something like doves. They would have uh, dove coats, so little houses for doves to come in. Yeah. And they would sleep there at night and just go out and feed during the day like you would have loose chickens. And if you needed doves for your dish, well, you'd just go and get them at night because that's where they roost. Interesting. Oh, did not know that. Yeah. So the first step here is to butter this bowl. It calls for buttering of like two ounces of butter. Obviously, it's a bigger bowl than we have here, but I might have a full ounce of butter. There's a reason why we wouldn't have all this butter in here. It's because we need this vermicelli to stick in a thatched roof style. And uh, since this is the challenging part, I'm going to give Joe the job of figuring out how to arrange those vermicellis in the bottom of this, kind of stick it into that butter, and give us a thatched roof. Kind of, your interpretation. I'll do of my. Roof. I'll do my best. I feel like yesterday I, I built a chair, and today I gotta do something much more meticulous. This is feel like a Townsend's uh, company challenge. Yep. So this is a pretty meticulous. I guess it's a kind of just a miniature version of having to uh, do an actual roof like you did. Mm -hmm. Congratulations on that, by the way. Well, it, it was fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It certainly is nice to have a, a finished roof that doesn't leak on you while you're trying to do things. Right. I can imagine. Am I doing this somewhat right? You're doing it perfectly. Okay. Um, I never made a quail pie before, but I really want to if I, probably the only one I will ever do in my life, so I want to make sure it's decent. Well, when you get back to New York, you can do pigeon. <laughs> hey, it's free. I saw the, the video where you made a fish pie that looked like a fish, and now we're making a, a pie that looked like a house. Um, are you, was it a kind of a theme to make food that looked like objects back then? Yeah, they had a lot of fun with uh, that sort of thing. They would also do things uh, like making their recipes for a sham pig, so that you would make something that was the shape of a pig, but made out of something else, like mashed potatoes. Uh, they would also take That's wild. <laughs> they would also take a whole bird yep. and skin it, cook it, maybe even make a sausage type of a product out of it, and then put it back in the skin, sew it up. And then you would cut into this thing and it would be totally different on the inside. Yeah. I guess uh, if somebody served that at a dinner party today, you'd probably call them uh, nuts. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it sounds interesting. I mean, it sounds like, I mean, I suppose you had a, 
a bit more time to cook and put attention into details back then. Certainly, and... certainly. I think we're looking pretty good. I think we can yep. stop at that point. Okay. I can stop torturing you with the thatch. You're not nervous about that, are you? Uh, yeah, I don't want to ruin this pie. It's going to be good. It's okay. going to be good. Don't worry. We're going to set that aside. And now it's time to make the paste. So have you ever made pie crust? Uh, yeah, a while ago. Good, good. So a lot of people are scared of making pie crust. Yeah, I know, but it always tastes better than the store pot stuff. You know it, 100% of the time. Uh, we have two cups of flour, regular all-purpose flour. Um, I don't know. We're going to add some butter. Uh, nice. Cold cold butter, we, we diced up nice and small. Um, no, we're going we're gonna to use all of it. Okay. Most of it. So we've got our butter in here. Joe, you want to uh, rub this butter in? It'd be a dream. Is there anything I should keep in mind as I do it? Well, you're trying to break that butter all into the flour, and you're, you don't want to heat it up with your fingers. That, okay. You want that, that butter to stay cold. Sure. So sort of rub it in and then move on to a next section. And just rub it so that it gets all down into the smallest little portions possible. Sure. Okay, let's take a look. Looks perfect. Good job, Joe. Thanks. I will add a little bit of cold water in here. Sure. We want just enough cold water to bring this into a ball. We don't uh, don't need a, the least quantity of water possible. Gotcha. But it's not sort of clumping up yet, so we're gonna add a little bit more. Now we can start to see, you know, it just sort of starts to want to turn into a paste for us. We still have a little bit of stuff in the bottom. It's starting to smell good though, all that butter. Yeah, it does. And uh, back in the 18th century, they uh, always made sure to wash their hands after using the bathroom before cooking, right? Every single time. That's good. You didn't have to worry about that. So let's get this uh, out on the table. Let me just, it'll, it's definitely gonna hold together for us. You take that for a second. Let me uh, sure. spread some flour here on our work surface. Oh, there's a little bit of water. That's not gonna help us out any. And uh, yeah, turn that out on there. There it is. Oh gosh, there we go. No, no, it's perfect. We'll just bring that together. And we'll see if we can pick these pieces up real quick. Might just need a hair bit more water, okay? But we'll see. We'll see. Just dribble a little bit there in the middle. That's good. Luckily, this does not need to be the lightest, fluffiest pie crust in the universe. Okay. So if if we, uh, you know, if we have to work it. A little bit more, it's not gonna hurt it any. Yeah. Here, let me get a little bit of flour on that. There you go, Joe. <laughs> Have at it. You guys are really putting me to work. It's kind of interesting to me that this just kind of got two things that you don't see quite as often anymore in like uh, current American cooking. And one is uh, uh, like a, a savory pies. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, uh, again, the small birds and quails. And it, 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 yeah, I just wondered why those things didn't uh, make the test of time. I guess the birds make sense. You were saying earlier that you just get so much extra meat off of a chicken that it's not worth eating, I don't know, a dozen quails for the same amount of meat. But mm -hmm. why do you think about the yeah. pies? I think the classic uh, answer here is that we still have plenty of savory pies. We just don't call them pies. We call them casseroles. Uh, we don't put a crust in them anymore. Yeah. Or maybe we just put dumplings on the top of them or to get that sort of pie you know, texture in there if we want, like the crust. Yeah. But nobody wants to t take the time to make crust anymore, right? Uh, it's worth it. Yeah. It's worth it. Thank you. So this is very good. Um, we need to get this into our our uh, pie dish. And this is a deep dish. It's gonna fight us a little bit, uh, but that's all right. Pretty pretty deep, what the, the recipe said. That's right, right. Pretty deep. So let me just uh, cut this into a bit of a circle here so that we don't have to fight it. There we go. Got that. And 
There you go. And we're going to quarter this so that it lays in properly. So we can get the center in without disturbing it. That's really clever. So, oh, my wife told me how to do it. <laughs> so here we go. We're gonna lay the center in like that. We're gonna bring open up our quarters. And then, again, not disturbing all that wonderful vermicelli that you put in earlier. I worked so hard on that That's vermicelli. Right. We don't wanna mess it up. Uh, so then we get this, and it's thick, right? She calls her a nice thick crust. That's good. Mm -hmm. uh, that'll bring a lot of uh, wonderful texture and flavor, and it has to seal this up. We don't want to lose uh, the moisture of our birds. So let's get this all smushed in here. And I, I'm pressing this in so that the vermicelli is in the paste itself. Uh, so that it uh, gives us the right look and doesn't just fall off. Because right. we're going to turn this over and we don't want our thatch to just drop off. No. Same as the regular roof. Now it's time to work on our birds. <laughs> Love that sentence. And we've got our birds now. These need to be buttered inside and out. Love that sentence even more. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, I, I've got three birds here. I think we're only going to use two. So grab yourself some butter here. Okay. And uh, we're just going to take our bird and just going to butter him up. Okay. And we want to make sure that the butter goes all over the outside of our bird and into the cavity in the center. Okay. Now we need plenty of salt and pepper, okay. uh, and that's the nice thing about the you know the, the butter in here is that yeah. we, we've got oh boy that's a lot, um, but we want to get that everywhere. Sure. Okay, used a lot of pepper. I like pepper. You can't go wrong. No pepper. Would you? Okay, ask you uh, in terms of seasoning. Does uh, would you prefer classic salt and pepper or nutmeg? Uh, for a, for a period dish, I mean, many times nutmeg would go in here, and I would definitely put nutmeg in. Yeah. But uh, this one doesn't, so I mean, maybe if they weren't looking, we could add some. You know, they won't know. They don't they have, have to know. Exactly. Let us put these birds in, as it says, breast down. So, I there's mine placed in there. Okay. Yours is placed in there. There we go. You can see birds. Kind of qualifies as a Halloween dish, maybe. <laughs> I, let me see how a third one would fit in here. And I just, just don't think he's going to fit. He might. He might. Should we go for it? Yeah, I'm going to go ahead. If you had a restaurant, you could... Uh, advertise a, th a three bird pie as opposed to right. two bird pie. It's definitely going to uh, definitely going to bring more folks in. Our pies have three birds. That's right. What is uh, your favorite quail dish, would you say? Uh, <laughs> uh, I have to think about that one. More pigeon dish or Yes, pie? yes. Uh, I think this is the best way to do it. Yeah. Because it's uh, so simple, we we don't want to cover up our our bird with too fancy of a dish. So yeah. sometimes they'll have lots and lots of different kinds of gravy, and you're hiding then the the flavor of your of your bird. So if you're gonna uh, have something as special as quail, you don't want to hide it behind a fancy sauce or gravy. That makes sense. Um, I guess I could wait till it's finished. But is there a difference between like? flavor of quail or versus a larger bird uh we're gonna have more dark meat okay. in this uh and as far as i'm concerned dark meat is more flavorful so it's going to be a more flavorful bird yeah hard to argue with that
What do you think, Joe? Should we get it into the moderate oven? Yeah, it goes into a moderate oven. You would probably cook this in a modern oven at, oh, 325, 350 degrees. We don't want it to be too hot um, because it'll, it'll brown or blacken our pie crust before the insides get cooked. Right. So we want it to cook kind of slow, especially if you've got lots of dense meat in there. Mm -hmm. uh, in this case, um, I'm going to go ahead and push it up to probably 350 and it may take as long as an hour to uh, bake. It really depends on how big our dish is. Yep. I did in one earlier and it was dense. It took almost two hours, but I don't think this will take as long. Okay. So we're gonna take it out to the earthen oven that's already been prepared up to heat. Sounds great. Joe, it's out of the oven and it looks good. Very good. Better than I thought it would when I put all the noodles in. Yeah. And it smells good. And that's the test as far as I'm concerned. My test is, are these birds cooked enough? But uh, hey. I'm willing to eat it no matter how cooked or raw they are. Oh, oh that's my promise right I don't now. think so. So I think what we're going to do is just, uh, you know, it would come to the table like this. It would be sat, as she says, uh, you know, in the corner of the table. Uh, and it came out looking pretty, and then yeah. then it's time to serve it. So the question is, is, does this really look like a thatched house pie? With some imagination, I hope I did a good enough job. I mean, we could put little people or a doorway. I mean, if we really wanted to, I don't think that's what they were really trying to go for. Um, maybe if we baked it a little bit longer at a hotter temperature, the color differential might have been made more, but True. I, you know, I think it's just an idea and it was fun. And uh, I don't know, it has to be that much better. No, it's definitely more exciting than just a regular meat pie on oh. its own. You know it. I know it. <laughs> Put this one on your plate. Okay. I think this is the one you prepared. There you go. Well, you Enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> it's a miniature bird for sure. There he is. Wow. That smells really nice. Yeah. It almost maybe what do you think? it almost smells a little bit more like turkey than chicken to me. It might have, again, a lot more um, sort of dark meat to it and, and yeah. uh, maybe a little more gamey. Okay. Uh, I think I'm going to take a drumstick. That sounds good. I almost need uh, smaller utensils for a smaller bird. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is really good. I can't, I mean, butter, salt, and pepper. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. It's weird how good this tastes. <laughs> I can't believe it. The, um, yeah, because they don't get, um, 
quite as brown as if you had roasted them without the pie. Oh, so no. it kind of makes you wonder, are they cooked, aren't they? Because mm. if somebody served me a chicken out of the oven this color, I would be a little nervous. Well, this is, uh, it's kept all the juices in. If we would roast this, we would lose so much of that moisture and we get a dry chicken, but this is just so moist. I agree. Mm. This might, uh, I don't know, perhaps gross some people out, but thinking about eating the bottom with all the juice in it would probably be pretty tasty. Oh yeah. Well, since we turned this over, these were in the very bottom. Oh, so if I, I uh, is it, uh, should we split the roof in half? And yeah, have a taste? yeah, definitely. Thank you. You're welcome. Let's find out how that crust worked out. Mm. It's got that wonderful chicken flavor built right in. Mm -hmm. Well, I think this turned out fabulous. And it's so much fun. We get to see the thatched roof. We get to take the roof off. We get to enjoy this amazing miniature bird in here. I'm so glad that we had a chance to actually find miniature birds to put in here instead of just chicken pieces, right? Definitely. Because it was a fun experiment. It's like a, um, it's, uh, eating it is kind of an event in itself. Mm -hmm. Taking the roof off, taking the little chickens, or quail, forgive me. <laughs> I don't want to offend the quail uh, yeah. fans. Uh, but yeah, no, it's a, yeah, it's an experience. And if we hadn't had to wait an hour in the oven, it would be pretty simple to make at home if you can get your hands on some quail. Right, and um, you know, a Cornish game hen would even fill up, you know, just one in the dish. It might be a little different, but it would be fun nonetheless. Definitely. A great uh, dish that is easy to do, right? I mean, uh, Make a little paste. You could even buy your uh, your pie crust if you really wanted to, but it's just so much fun to make your own. And a little bit of salt and pepper, pepper butter, and a bird, and off you go. You've got this wonderful, fun dish that everyone can enjoy. So yeah, Joe, thank you for yeah. coming in. It was such a pleasure and like a real dream to help you cook. Uh, yeah, so uh, thank you for including me. Proceeded up the river, find the navigation worse, more rapids and strong current. Surrounded 30 buffaloes as they were crossing the river, shot two young heifers and caught two calves alive whose ears we marked and turned them out again. Uh, hello, uh, my name's Joe Para, and the weather's not so great today, so uh, John and I are inside drinking coffee and reading some books. Um, I know you're familiar with this one, the, Journal of Nicholas Cresswell, and uh, John uh, suggested I read two passages that uh, might be fun. One is about buffaloes, uh, other is about potatoes, and uh, couldn't say no to that. So uh, here goes nothing. Wednesday, May 24th, 1775. Land in general covered with beach, limestone and large flags. Few rivulets empty into the river, or few springs to be seen, which makes me suppose the country is badly watered. Camped at a place where the buffaloes crossed the river. In the night, we're alarmed with a plunging in the river. In a little time, Mr. Johnston, who slept on board, called out for help. We ran to his assistance with our arms and, to our great mortification and surprise, found one of our canoes that had all the flour on board sunk and would have been inevitably lost had it not been fixed to the other. We immediately hauled our shattered vessel to the shore and landed our things, though greatly damaged. It was done by the buffaloes crossing the river from that side where the vessel was moored. Fortunately for Mr. Johnston, he slept in that canoe next to the shore. 
The buffaloes jumped over him into the other and split it about 14 foot. Mr. Norse and Miss Taylor's servants usually slept on board, but had by mistake brought their blankets on shore this evening and were too lazy to go on board again, and or probably they would have been killed. Repairing our vessel by putting in knees and caulking her with the bark of the white elm pounded to a paste, which is tough and glutinous, something like bird lime, and answers the purpose very well. Some of the company shot a buffalo bull, saw several cross the river while we were at work. Two canoes full of men passed us going down the river, going to Fort Pitt. I'm convinced Rice will ought go with me, find he is a great coward. On inspection, find our flour is much damaged, obliged to come an allowance of a pint a man per day. Had we come to this resolution sooner, it would have been better. Great quarreling among the company. Wild to think that uh, you go to bed at night thinking everything's fine and the next morning buffaloes come break your canoes and ruin all your flour. If I was with that company, I definitely would quarrel as well. This one is from Monday, July 3rd, 1775. Got underway very early this morning, not a morsel to eat. Our people quarreled very much, but behaved to me with great respect. Camped very late. Tuesday, July 4th, 1775. Got to the mouth of Little Con Highway. How do you say that, John? Close enough. <laughs> About noon, when I found myself very sick at the stomach for want of meat. Went to shore and got a little ginseng root and chewed it, which refreshed me exceedingly. In the evening, got to one Dr. Briscoe's plantation about a mile from the river. It was night when we got there, found the house deserted, no corn, fowls, or meat of any kind. We all went into the garden, dark as it was, to get cucumbers or anything we could find that we could eat. Found a potato bed, and I ate about a dozen of them raw and thought them the most delicious food I ever ate in my life. Heavy and constant rain all day. Made a fire in the house, dried ourselves, and went to sleep. Very much fatigued. Wednesday, July 5th, 1775. This morning, one of the company went to the canoe for our kettle. The rest plundered about the plantation and got some young cabbages, squashes, and cymbalines. I'm not familiar with the cym... No? Neither am I. It's uh, capitalized, so it must be pretty good. This medley of vegetables we boiled all together and seasoned with pepper and salt, and it made a most elegant repast. Proceeded to French Creek, where Cressup's people overtook us, but would not give us a mouthful of vi victuals? Yeah. May I ask what that is? Food. Oh, that makes sense. Very unkind of them, though. Rain all day. One of our people's sick. I gave half a dollar for about two ounces of bread for him. The next day. Got to one Pursley's plantation where we got some sour milk, but no bread. I dare eat none of it. Got me ginseng root. This is an excellent stomatic. Went to sleep very hungry. Our sick man, much better. Well, that's good. I was worried about the sick man. Um, Pretty wild about the dozen potatoes, uh, especially raw. But I guess you could eat anything if you have enough ginseng to settle your stomach. Um, I guess the thing I found most fascinating about these chapters is how specific he is about what he eats. If you saw that in a, a TV show or movie or book nowadays, you'd think it'd be extraneous information, but I guess if you're hungry in the wilderness is the most important thing to write about. Um, I guess uh, if it was at a bar back then, you know, you find out most of what you need to know about a person by just asking, uh, uh, what did you eat for breakfast? And uh, when was the last time your supplies were trampled by buffaloes? Really fun book, and uh, I guess if you're interested in reading what else Nicholas Cresswell ate, uh, recommend that you check it out sometime.
Uh, I'm fascinated and uh, yeah, good tip on the ginseng. Welcome to the Nutmeg Tavern. This is a very special episode. We're not live, but I do have a special guest here in the Nutmeg Tavern, Joe Para. Hey, thanks for having me to your party, John. We have this wonderful punch that Ryan has made up. We are going to put a little nutmeg in our punch. And here, Joe, you want to you put your own? That way you get to decide how okay. much nutmeg you want. Thank you. Because um, nutmeg is part of the recipe. Mmm, that looks good. And this is incredible punch. Ryan made this punch up earlier. We have a recipe for punch right here. I don't know, Joe, you want to read the recipe for punch? Of course. It's called uh, a remarkable bowl of punch. On the 25th of October, 1694, a bowl of punch was made at the Right Honorable Edward Ruffles house when he was Captain General and Commander-in-Chief of His Majesty's forces in the Mediterranean Sea. It was made in a garden in the middle of four walks, all covered overhead with orange and lemon trees. And in every walk was a table, the whole length of it, covered with cold collations and... How would you... Etc. Oh, there's an ampersand C period, etc. Mm -hmm. Cool. And the said fountains were the following ingredients, viz. Four hogsheads of brandy, eight hogsheads of water, 25,000 lemons, 20 gallons of lime juice, 1,300 weight of fine white Lisbon sugar, five pounds of grated nutmeg, 300 toasted biscuits, and a pipe of dry mountain malaga. Over the fountain was a large canopy built to keep off the rain, and there was built on a purpose a little boat wherein was a boy belonging to the fleet who rowed round the fountain and filled the cups to the company. And in all probability, more than 6,000 men drank thereof. Wow. Well, that's a lot of uh, booze. <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, that would have been quite a party. And punch is the drink of a party. And this punch, just like that one, has uh, brandy, it has water, it has uh, citrus fruits in it, it's got wine and sugar. And this is a uh, very, very nice and well, even ground nutmeg. So excellent, excellent punch. I'm, I'm afraid to drink a little too much of this punch. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna be very judicious with this punch. I've got some images, Joe, and I thought you could help me work through these. A lot of times when I'm looking at images, um, you know, I've looked at them a lot and, and I don't catch some of the ideas that regular people might see it and have questions about. Sure. So when we do a live stream, it's really nice to get the audience to chime in in uh, comments. And today you are the audience. You get to ask the questions. Okay. I'll, I'll do my best to uh, represent the audience at home. So we've got our first image. This is uh, likely about uh, 1780. This is an image from Great Britain. And uh, we have uh, folks going to a party. That's why this is uh, here in the, uh, in the images. We've got party goers and they are being boisterous. And then we have sort of the, uh, the foreground action that's, that's going on with uh, sort of how they're reacting. You can imagine a carload of party years heading to a party and they're you know hanging out the windows and yelling yeah. and then you know how the folks around them are reacting yeah i mean it's not even nighttime yet so they're pretty serious about this party <laughs> definitely definitely uh it could be you know they're headed to um you know a national uh victory or something or, or it could be some other kind of party they're headed to that is a, the ultimate uh, you know if it was just a man and a woman who were scampered by the wagon it would be one thing but when you make a donkey run away then you know it's serious party business exactly um it's like uh i was looking at it it uh makes me think like uh if uh, the benny hill theme song was around back then it would be playing probably 
We've moved much further back in time and we've moved on to the continent. This might even be as early as the uh, 1600s, probably a 17th century image, likely Dutch here. And we have uh, a party. You know it's a party when someone's got a hurdy-gurdy. Everybody loves that drone noise. Mm -hmm. Was she invited to the party or did they hire her to come by and play outside? That, I believe, is probably what's going on. It may be a market day and she may be moving from sort of house to house or shop to shop. I'm sure it was quite something to listen to. Beautiful music. They're having fun. And I believe yeah. this is probably a tavern that she's playing right out in front of. It's not very nice to her, but if they got sick of the, the hurdy-gurdy music, they could just close the door and go back to drinking. Sometimes we get some fun caricatures and uh, the artist is moving into the caricature here. We've got the musicians up high yeah. again so that that music carries out. It's like they're up on a stage. Right? Yeah. And I can't imagine this one, uh, fiddle and whatever sort of trumpet horn thing that poor gentleman is playing. It must have been uh, a lively tune. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think that the artist like the people he was portraying here because is the heads are all shaped kind of like eggs yeah uh, <laughs> no i would i would say he's <laughs> probably playing up to a certain uh making fun of a certain class uh, this one is a festive play we have the flying man with the horn and yep. classic character type basically in every show these days right <laughs> yep. and then we have the woman with the very long nose <laughs> specimens of waltzing uh 1718 so we, we uh, move uh, back into the that early 19th century time period and we can partially tell that by their clothing and we see the funny hairstyles they're having fun showing uh -huh. us that before this the idea of facial hair really is out of vogue are they making fun of them again in this one um let's say yes let's go with that oh, we've got this outdoor scene probably out in front of a tavern again yeah. and uh you know so it, it's a bit like a hogarth image where we have Lots of things going on. Mm -hmm. uh, we can see it's likely, uh, I'm guessing, a wedding. I am not sure who the man is on this very uh, right-hand side, but he's in kind of tattered clothing. Mm -hmm. And he's been given this a wreath to wear on his head. Yeah. And he's reading some proclamation. Do you think he was involved in the wedding technically, or did he come to do some kind of town reading proclamation? And I it just kind of collided. I really wish I knew. I think it's part of the story that we're just going to have to, you know, tell to ourselves and uh, figure out. It's cool. It's like uh, you asked, how was, how did the wedding go last week? And then they put all of the highlights into one picture and it feels like a... Exactly. That's cool. Yeah, I think probably that is a good interpretation that we've got different times going on and they just sort of jam them all together so they yeah. see it all happen at once. It kind of feels like that. So this is, uh, I believe it's Dutch military folks. Is that the Christmas tree? It is a celebratory tree and it's wintertime, but unfortunately it's not a Christmas tree. Oh, bummer. Yeah, it's a, it's a celebratory tree celebrating um, a revolution. This has got to be a Christmas party. Um, no, I don't think so. I don't know the specifics behind this particular celebration. Yeah. Uh, late 18th century, a big fountain, giant, you know, giant fountain. It even looks like they have Christmas lights on the, on the buildings. I don't know how they would have done that in the 18th century. Here is a probably a later uh, 18th century image. Uh, it says it's May Day, and there are lots of different uh, celebratory time periods. Okay, so it's not a Christmas celebration? No, no, this this one is not a Christmas celebration. May Day was a very, very popular uh, time, and they would dance around a tree or maypole. In Buffalo, they, they have uh, Dingus Day, mm. really large. It's like the Polish uh, spring holiday. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I think the, the women hit the men with the Stick? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Pretty funny. Oh, is this a Christmas celebration? 
No, no, this is probably another one of those uh, spring sort of celebrations. This is a Dutch image, uh, late 17th century, likely. And uh, we have our classic um, hogs off on one side, mm -hmm. uh, people falling on the ground, people dancing, the man pelling bagpipes. Um. We even have our dovecotes. So, you know, oh. uh, see the the, uh, the upper part of the roof there, there would, uh, that's where you'd, you'd go up and, and harvest your doves. If you want to make a meat pie. That's right. <laughs> That's great. Sorry I keep asking about Christmas trees, but uh, this is kind of an uh, interest of mine. Yeah. Is, uh, were there Christmas trees, Christmas parties back then? There were Christmas parties, depending on where you were at and the time period. Dickens really brings Christmas back to, to life. And he's looking back at an earlier era and he's trying to, and he does, sort of bring Christmas back into kind of what we think Christmas is. But Christmas had really fallen away and um, there were times when Christmas was sort of outlawed. Um, at the very beginning of the uh, English Civil War, yeah. when the parliamentarians come to power, they say, no, you, we're not doing Christmas. It's against the law to not have your shop open on Christmas Day, and you should not eat plum pudding, you should yeah. not do a Christmas celebration. Well, that's not how you win fans over. Apparently not, because they, they lost after a while. <laughs> mm, what the? Caricatures and, and party and drinking, and you know we get to see close up, uh, the gentlemen are eating um, oysters mm. and uh, drinking wine, uh, and, or, or punch. It feels, um, Kind of modern, actually. Yeah, it does. Ah, there. There's the classic uh, fireworks uh, in Covent Garden, 1690. So a very early one. Uh, we see the, you know, you can how do, how you catch, you know, fireworks in a in a single still image. You know, how do we get this, you know, uh, yeah. going on? But we can see the Catherine wheels. And we can see the, you know, the sort of zigzaggy uh, uh, fireworks going on and fountains of light going on, and uh, it looks. Very dangerous. It seems like a wild time. What did, what did they, is that a Catherine wheel? You said that they yeah. set on fire. Catherine wheel there in, in the center sort of background there that, you know, sort of rockets on a spinning wheel mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, fountains of light and uh, probably people catching fire. I don't think they would uh, allow people to do those kinds of fireworks today. Unfortunately, no. Let's finish up on a true party, just like this one. Okay, not like this one, but a, the giant punch bowl and uh, lots of uh, fun things going on here. This is a Midnight Modern con Conversation, mm -hmm. classic print from the time period. And uh, boy, what, what do you think about that, Joe? It seems, yes, definitely late at night. <laughs> um, oh gosh, they're gonna feel horrible tomorrow. I think they're already feeling horrible, most of them. Uh, this is sort of possibly a gentleman's club uh, oh. in that we see here on the mantelpiece, uh, I think those are actually uh, like little little paddles or rackets to play a game. So they like, like play ping pong sort of in there, yeah. <laughs> in there. And uh, you know, they're, they're, it's set up with lots of drinks and you know, entertainment uh, if they want entertainment. I wonder if, um, yeah, whether it's trying to depict that it's a, a humorous scene or if people drank that way to get to that point back then or well let's just say this the artist here is is making fun of this set of people who would who would uh, drink to the success and uh, you know the artist uh, is definitely trying to say something saying you know this isn't the best part of society he's not necessarily painting this because it's fun or because it's funny but he's saying this is uh if this is what society is like maybe we need to rethink what we do forgive this comparison but like perhaps this image is modern version is uh real housewives of uh blank city you know you can watch these uh, the people and their lives and judge it, but at the same time. You can't turn away from the car wreck. Uh, John, I actually uh, looked up some uh, toasts of the time period. That okay. I, I hope you don't mind if I share. Of course not. Um, so I guess at the beginning you uh, say, uh, pray, raise your glass, and then uh, this one is from 1772. 
to the health and good fortune of those friends and company tonight. May they never run out of their favorite condiment, mushroom ketchup. Mushroom ketchup. Mmm. Uh, you got another one from uh, uh, 1778. Uh, uh, perpetual union to the colonies, a long and happy peace, uh, full of mushroom ketchup. Mushroom ketchup. These are all real, by the way. You must have really liked that mushroom ketchup. And then uh, this is a 1781. Uh, may you be in heaven a full half hour before the devil knows you've taken his mushroom ketchup. Mushroom ketchup. <laughs> Sorry, mm -hmm. I didn't actually find these in the book. <laughs> <laughs> We've been able to see lots of parties, whether they were, you know, good parties or uh, right parties. Some of them uh, obviously went a little too far, mm -hmm. uh, but some of them looked like they were, you know, they kept within bounds and they uh, they had a very good time. Yeah. Uh, I am so happy to spend this party time with you. Yeah, thank you. It's it's been a great set of episodes, and thank you so much for coming and spending time with us. Thank you for having me.